Hi everyone, I'm Anila Balkasun, SPICI's Executive Director. Thank you for staying with us today. I have the great honor of introducing our next keynote speaker, Dr. Keon West. You're in for a real treat. Dr. West will be giving this year's presidential address entitled, Asking the Right Questions. I think it's an important notion for us to ponder throughout the week's uh, conference events and as you continue your own research. Dr. Keon West is a social psychologist who specializes in prejudice and intergroup relations. Born in Trinidad, raised in Jamaica, and educated at McAllister in Minnesota in the United States, there's a bond in Paris, France, and Oxford in Oxford, United Kingdom, under a Rhodes Scholarship. He now works as a reader or associate professor at Goldsmiths, University of London. In addition to being current SPICI president, he is director of Equilab at Goldsmiths and the principal investigator on a European Research Council grant investigating lay beliefs about sexual orientation. He's appeared many times on radio and television as a scientific expert, including on Channel 4's Is Dating Racist and Naked Beach, and on the BBC's I Can't Be Racist and Across Jamaica's Gay Divide. Dr. West is past recipient of two of SPICI's prominent scholarly awards, in 2015 receiving the Michelle Alexander Early Career Award for Scholarship and Service, and in 2017 receiving SPICI's Outstanding Teaching and Mentoring. I'm so pleased he can be with us uh, and share his important work today. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Keon West. Hello, everyone and welcome to the 2021 SPICI Presidential Address. So I'm Dr. Keon West, SPICI President for this year, and this is one of the last things I'll do in that role. In both the United States of America, where most of you are, and the United Kingdom, where I currently am, there is a fierce and growing debate about critical race theory, and specifically, whether it should be taught in schools. According to US Senator Ted Cruz, critical race theory says that every white person, and I quote here, every white person is racist, and that certain children are inherently bad people because of the color of their skin. Christopher Rufo, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a libertarian think tank, wrote an article in USA Today called what I discovered about critical race theory in public schools and why it shouldn't be taught. In his article, Rufo claims that critical race theory is a form of, and I quote again, race-based Marxism. Agreeing with Senator Cruz, Rufo says that critical race theory ascribes a moral superiority to individuals based on their race. Whites are deemed inherently racist and oppressive People of color, by contrast, are inherently virtuous and liberatory. To date, at least five states in the US have passed critical race theory bills, restricting what a teacher may talk about or may be compelled to talk about. At least 12 other states are considering similar bills. Not to be outdone by the Americans, the British government has weighed in in very similar ways. No one less than the British government's Women and Equalities Minister, and let that sink in, the Women and Equalities Minister, MP Kemi Badenoch, said that many, and I quote again, proponents of critical race theory actually want a segregated society. Badenoch described critical race theory as an ideology that sees my blackness as victimhood. Badenoch is a black woman and their whiteness as oppression. She further stated that teachers were breaking the law if they taught their pupils about a range of topics, including white privilege and critical race theory, as if they were fact, rather than merely one side's political opinion. <clears throat> of course, some people have presented opposing views. Professor Kevin Cockley, a professor of psychology and black studies, has argued also in USA Today that we should be teaching critical race theory in schools. 
because teaching students about systemic racism is essential for understanding contemporary American society. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, a law professor who helped coin the term critical race theory, is similarly supportive of teaching it. She, like Cockley, points out that many of those who oppose the teaching of critical race theory are doing so based on made-up definitions and descriptors, and that many of these made-up definitions present critical race theory unfairly as hostile, divisive, and un-American. You, like Professors Cockley and Crenshaw, may feel a strong desire to weigh in on this debate. You may want to correct erroneous definitions of critical race theory offered by some politicians. You may have an opinion on whether or not we should teach critical race theory in schools. And whatever your opinion is, I respect your right to have it. However, the entire debate around critical race theory brings to my mind a quote widely attributed to Thomas Pynchon and also recently used by Professor Liz Cole in her discussion of free speech. And that quote is this, if they can get to you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about your answers. I'll say that again. If they can get to you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about your answers. I think that should we teach critical race theory in schools is very much the wrong question. Indeed, I'd go further. I'd say it's a distraction. It's meant to use up time and effort that we could spend on much better questions. And I hope that I can point us in the direction of some of those better questions now. To start, let's look at what the situation really is in our societies. Consider this. Most majority group members in the US and the UK simply do not believe in contemporary bias as it is described in the scientific literature. I'm not referring to a knowledge of the high-level debates about the nature of prejudice or the utility of strategies like affirmative action or unconscious bias training. I am referring to a basic belief, a basic belief that things like sexism and racism exist in our society and that they have measurable, tangible outcomes. According to a representative poll of British adults, conducted by Modin in 2018. The majority of those polled thought that minorities faced less or the same discrimination as white people in the news, in TV or films, in the workplace, in access to finance, access to jobs, to university or to good schooling. Now this majority, it's not very big, it wavers between about 52% and about 60%, but that's still a majority. The results in the United States are somewhat similar. While about half of the white American population believe that, and I quote, racism against blacks is widespread in the US, at least according to a Gallup poll in 2021, it's also true that a growing number of white Americans believe that reverse racism or racism against white people is more prevalent. This is something that was put forth by Norton and Summers in 2011. And I know further research has challenged the proportions of those numbers, but it's still worth seeing how big they are or they could be. Concerning sexism, a study by the Pew Research Center found that most American men, 56% of American men, don't think that women still face obstacles that make it harder to get ahead. And a large-scale British survey found that 50% of young men, that's defined as 16 to 24-year-olds, and these are the young men who are supposed to be, in general, more liberal than the older ones, 50% of them believe that feminism has gone too far. 
I know that these numbers hover around the halfway mark, about 50%, higher than 50%, about 60%, but that's still reliably half, or slightly more than half of the population that apparently don't believe that the prejudice we investigate is even real. I understand that no scientific field is uniformly accepted by the entire population of any country. But in terms of confidence, we in social psychology and the related disciplines lag behind other areas. For example, since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've heard a lot about people who are skeptical of or opposed to vaccinations. However, recent work by Durkee in 2021 found that only 16% of Americans, only 16%, reported a general opposition to vaccinations. According to the British Office of National Statistics, that number is even lower in the UK. Only about 4% of the population could be described as vaccine hesitant. Compare that to the over 50% of British people who think that ethnic minorities face the same discrimination or less discrimination than white people do in a host of circumstances. Compare that to the 56% of American men who don't think women face obstacles today. Another example, the teaching of evolution in schools was once a point of great political contention, and perhaps it remains so in some areas. However, research by Frank and colleagues published in 2019 in Scientific American found that only 18% of Americans don't believe in evolution. It's only 18%. In the UK, that number is even smaller. Only about 4% of people don't believe in evolution. These proportions, 4%, 16%, 18% of people who reject the scientific consensus around vaccines or evolution, they pale in comparison to the enormous 50 to 60% of people who don't accept the scientific consensus around racism, sexism, or intergroup bias more generally. Perhaps worse still, there's sometimes an unnecessary lack of confidence, even in our own field, about the epistemological strength of our discipline. I'll give one example. This year, I submitted a manuscript on the topic of racism and responses to the Black Lives Matter movement. The review process was excellent, by the way. It was quick and professional, um, and the manuscript was accepted in the end. So I really have no reason to complain, and I'm not complaining. However, one of the anonymous reviewers made a remark that slightly troubled me. The reviewer expressed discomfort with what they described as an, and I quote, an overemphasis on empirical evidence, and said that this may overshadow the real issue, that, as they said, that racism kills and does other harm, and that we know that sometimes it is still hard or even impossible to show that empirically. Now, I agree with that reviewer that the real issue is that racism causes harm and I agree that sometimes it is difficult to demonstrate that empirically. And it is possible, it's probable even, that there are real harms out there which as yet don't have empirical support. However, I also think that it undermines or downplays the decades of rigorous research that clearly shows the continued existence of contemporary racism. We don't have to make appeals to a certain kind of unknowability. And in scientific publishing about racism, there's absolutely no need to distance ourselves from the conclusions of empirical work. On the contrary, it is exactly this empirical work that should make us confident about the reality of contemporary bias. In a similar example, I remember reading a critique of microaggressions research written by Professor Lilienfeld and published in Perspectives on Psychological Science in 2017. Now, in this critique, 
Lilienfeld took the whole area to task. He cast doubt on the existence of microaggressions, their prevalence, their effects, and any efforts to reduce them, especially that, not particularly interested in the efforts to reduce them. And he suggested a number of ideas, including the idea that ethnic minority group members were over-detecting malicious racial intent where none existed, and overreacting to provocations that may be real, but were too slight to warrant the reactions they received. Professor Daryl Wing Su, one of the founders of contemporary microaggressions research, responded in a very kind and open-hearted way. He told a story of the importance of seeing different perspectives like the abstract and the real. That's how he labeled them, the abstract and the real. So he told this story about a Western teacher who asked her class, suppose there are four birds sitting on a tree branch. You take a slingshot and shoot one of them. How many are left? Now, a white student in the class quickly answered, three, four birds, you shoot one, there's three which the teacher said was correct. And then in the story, a Nigerian immigrant boy stated with equal certainty that the answer was zero. And the teacher laughed and said that this was incorrect. Now, after this, the Nigerian student became less interested, paid less attention, was less invested in mathematics class. And the point of Sue's story was that both answers are correct. In the abstract, 4 minus 1 is 3. Three birds on the branch. So that's the right answer. However, in the real, for anyone who has any experience with birds in the real world, we know that if there are four birds on a branch and you shoot one, the others will all fly away. There will be zero birds on the branch. Both answers are correct. It depends on your perspective. Sue declined to disagree with Lilienfeld on what he called the, the technical aspects of the research, the abstract, but instead made an appeal to Lilienfeld's potential willingness to accept the evidence of the real, the lived, albeit subjective experiences of people who experienced microaggressions themselves. I admire Professor Sue's open-hearted manner and I agree wholeheartedly with his points about considering different perspectives and about the possible overconfidence of the harsh empiricists in any field. We should look out for that. Still, I think Sue may have done his own research a disservice. There was no need to make appeals to open-mindedness or to a general willingness to accept different perspectives or to consider other types of perhaps non-scientific or, or less scientific epistemologies. Based on scientific rigor alone, there was more than enough to dispel Lilienfeld's arguments. And this was shown neatly enough by Professor Monica Williams two years later in 2019, when she published a comprehensive reply, also in Perspectives on Psychological Science, showing how much of Lilienfeld's knowledge was curtailed, and that some of his approaches and assumptions fell short of the scientific standard to which he held others. I contributed to this argument in my own small way in an article in Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. Um, the article I published showed that Lilienfeld's notion of hypersensitivity, the idea that ethnic minorities were overreacting to trivial slights, was at best unfounded and at worst demonstrably false. And in any case, that it was presented initially with little or no empirical evidence at all. Now, I want to be clear here. My point is not about who won the argument. That's not the point. I'm sure that there are spaces in which the argument will and should continue. There are genuine limitations to microaggressions research and honest, opinion, honest opposition, sorry, honest opposition 
by scientific minds of different beliefs is healthy and good. My point here is that there was never a need to appeal to an alternative epistemology, to general pleas for open-mindedness beyond the scientific evidence. That should not have been the first response. The evidence itself was quite strong, and I don't think it was helpful to allow or encourage the impression that it wasn't. I have mentioned the strength of this evidence a few times, so it would be remiss of me not to outline what some of this is. Um, most of you know this already and take it for granted, so I won't belabor it. But since half or more of the people outside this room, of mostly social psychologists, do not accept these things, it's probably worth mentioning it, even briefly. Even if we restrict our pool of research to the supposed gold standard of scientific research, and, and that's already a controversial thing to do, if we restrict our entire pool of acceptable research to the randomized control trial, leaving out everything, leaving out qualitative research entirely, leaving out everything that's based on large-scale surveys, leaving out all the, the quasi-experiments, even if we do that, we still find a wealth of research that clearly shows the existence of contemporary bias. I could cite CV studies, for example. I like citing those because the setup's incredibly simple and it's easy to understand. Um, in these studies, a set of CVs, or I think what you would call resumes, are created and sent out to potential employers. Hundreds of these CVs are created, or in some cases, thousands. The numbers vary between studies. And all of these CVs are either equivalent or, just as often, completely identical to each other, with the exception of one detail, the demographics of the person who ostensibly sent the CV. So you make up all these identical CVs, but some of them are presented as a man's CV, some as a woman's CV, some as a white person's CV, some as a black person's CV, or any other combination you like. But other than that identity, the CVs are all exactly the same. Now, we've been doing research like this for decades, and the pattern of results is remarkably consistent. If you go back to an almost 30-year-old study by S. Mail and Everington in 1993, they found that white doctors were twice as likely to be shortlisted for medical positions as exactly equally qualified South Asian counterparts. At about the same time, in, in 1999, uh, there was a similar study that looked at sexism in hiring practices by Steinpress, Anders, and Ridsk. And they found that academic psychologists were more likely to hire a man than an identically qualified woman. Now, there are, are many other studies like these. I could cite so many conducted in many different fields, in many different countries. In my own personal library, I have examples in examples coming from 2003, 2004, 2010, 2011, 2012, and this pattern has never gone away. In 2019, a large-scale British CV study found that ethnic minorities had to send 60% more applications to receive the same callback rates as equally qualified white applicants. That was Distasio and Heath in 2019, 60% more applications to receive the same callback rates. In 2020, some of my own colleagues, Eton, Eton, Saunders and Jacobson, found that women in academia are still perceived as less competent and less hireable than equally qualified men. And of course, it isn't just the workplace. You can do very similar randomized controlled trials, but instead of using CVs, you can use anything. You can use newspaper clippings, teacher profiles, pictures, court documents, dating profiles, or even actors in, in real life settings. And research using these designs has shown that ethnic minorities, even when they're otherwise identical to white counterparts, are nonetheless judged more harshly for committing the same crimes. That includes some of my own research, which has found that, looking at newspaper stories where you swap uh, 
one identity for another. Ethnic minorities are more likely to have inadmissible evidence used against them in court. They're more likely to be shot by police officers in simulations of split-second shooting decisions. That's some of the very well-known work by um, Charles Judd. Um, so a lot of you may know about that. They're less likely to receive support in universities. And I'm going to highlight the design of this study um, by Milkman and colleagues in, two, in 2015, because this one's relevant for some of you in the audience. In this study, they created a set of you know, equivalent or identical emails that they then sent out posing as potential PhD students, so hopeful PhD students looking for their supervisors. And they only varied the demographics of the person who was apparently sending the message. And they found, of course, that some people are much more likely to even get that first response than other people were. That ethnic minority students are less likely to get that response, even when they're equally qualified. And now something that might be very relevant to the other half of you in the audience. Um, another set of studies um, found that university students judge ethnic minority professors as less competent, less knowledgeable, and less legitimate when they look at their, their profiles before they even meet them. If you simply swap out the demographics of the person before they meet them, given the same information, they interpret the ethnic minority lecturers and professors as less competent and less legitimate. There's more research like this. It shows that Women, despite being totally identical to their male counterparts, are offered less pay for the same work, are more likely to be penalized for presenting themselves as agentic, are also less likely to receive support in universities and are judged less positively in student evaluations. And these are just a few examples of an enormous body of research. To say that I haven't scratched the surface is such an understatement. I haven't even begun to talk about whole realms of prejudice. I haven't spoken about sexual prejudice or religious prejudice or anti-trans prejudice or classism or anti-immigrant prejudice. There is so much more than I could begin to cover in a single talk. I could list these all day. And the scientific consensus is incredibly clear. There are it's worth pointing out, there are conservative social psychologists, and this may surprise you. Um, they are quick to point out that there aren't many, that they are a real minority in social psychology, and they do tell us why this might be a problem for the field, this lack of political diversity. I certainly don't agree with everything they publish, and they certainly don't agree with everything I publish. And sometimes we can point out genuine limitations in each other's work, which is a useful and productive thing in science. But liberal or conservative, the existence of contemporary bias is acknowledged as a factual, scientifically demonstrable reality. I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Robert D. Mather. He's a self-identified conservative social psychologist. He runs a blog in Psychology Today called The Conservative Social Psychologist, in case you doubt his conservativeness. He thinks a lot of things said by liberal social psychologists can be overstated. And I agree with him on some points. For example, I agree with him when he says that the media can often make things much, much worse. They can skew messages and exaggerate messages unhelpfully. He disagrees with many people about some things, like the usefulness of implicit biases for predicting behavior, which is an interesting question. Nonetheless, he acknowledges the existence of contemporary bias. Conservative psychologists don't argue about whether bias exists. They might argue about other aspects of it, but not that it exists. This is not a political issue or even a contentious scientific one. It's just a factual one. So when I look at this wealth of evidence, and when I think about how little the average person in our societies knows or believes about contemporary bias. When I think about how real and yet how invisible contemporary bias is, 
I don't think the right question is, should we be teaching critical race theory in schools? I think there are so many better questions. I'm sure you could come up with better questions right now. But here's one. Try this one. How can we improve general knowledge about contemporary bias? How can we improve the level of general knowledge about contemporary bias? What can we do to get the number of people who even accept the existence of racism or sexism to be higher than 50%? What is it that we in social psychology and the related disciplines are failing to do? Are there lessons that we can learn from other disciplines that are applicable here? In particular, I think about some of the research surrounding science denialism more broadly. Many of us may know that we believe, or many of us may know what we believe about contemporary bias. And we're well versed in the evidence and can make a convincing case for a peer reviewed journal. That's our job. That's what we do when we publish. And we can, hopefully, <laughs> communicate our findings clearly enough to classrooms or lecture halls of students who are already invested in understanding what we're saying. But that's not the same thing as understanding the strategies that work best when communicating with the wider public. There are many basic questions that we don't even consider. For example, and I'm going to ask you this genuinely, uh, when one encounters some form of science denialism, is it best to ignore it or is it best to challenge it? Now, ignoring it, that option runs the risk of letting it go unchecked. But challenging it, well, that runs a different risk. That runs the risk of drawing attention to it, accidentally giving it a platform, feeding the fire. I want you to think about it, and I want you to answer the question in your own mind. What do you think? Is it better to ignore it or to challenge it? Okay, well, I'll assume that you've come up with an answer. But according to research um, by Schmidt and Betch, covered, published in, in Nature in 2019, we should challenge it. Challenging is the option that works better. Apparently, ignoring it is what gives the inaccurate beliefs a chance to spread unchecked. And if we do challenge, at least according to research by Lewandowski, published in 2020, uh, a good strategy seems to be a combination of providing information and highlighting the scientific consensus. That seems to be a good strategy to take. Here's another question that I think is a better question than should we teach critical race theory in schools? How should our knowledge of contemporary bias affect government policy? How should our knowledge of contemporary bias affect government policy? I ask this one because the denial of contemporary bias isn't something that only occurs on the individual level. Governments are also involved. It wasn't too long ago that the last American presidential regime, the Trump administration, released Executive Order 13950. You may recognize it. It was called the Executive Order on Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. While the title sounds reasonable enough, the main thrust of the executive order was that any acknowledgement of contemporary bias was divisive, un-American, and unfair to white people and men. It claimed that there was a fringe ideology, and I am quoting, teaching that men and members of certain races, as well as our most venerable institutions, are inherently sexist and racist. Now, does any of that rhetoric sound familiar? Now, thankfully, some of us in the Spissy Council got together and worked on a statement replying to this executive order. And here I should really thank uh, Professor Nicole Buchanan and Dr. Tiffany Brannan, Patrick Zanska, Stephanie Goodwin, Kristen Dukes, and of course, Spissy Policy Director Sarah Mankol, who you know, really put in a lot of work on this. You can read the Spissy website. You can, you can read the reply on the Spissy website. It's, it's a good reply. I'm glad that we did it. But it's a travesty that such a reply had to be written in the first place. Given the vast empirical evidence about contemporary bias, any policy 
that starts, that uses as its starting place, ignoring or misrepresenting that scientific knowledge is bad policy. How do we get to a place where organizations like SPICI are no longer writing replies like these to things that governments say, but instead seeing knowledge about the reality of contemporary bias woven into government policy at all levels? I also want to note that this isn't unique to the United States. In the United Kingdom, our government really recently published, our government recently published um, something uh, we came to be known as a Sewell Report, uh, named after Tony Sewell, who, who spearheaded it. And the report was put together primarily by a group of non-academics. And perhaps the most notable thing about the report was that it found, and I quote, no evidence of systemic or institutional racism in the UK. A conclusion that was entirely at odds with what we know from our research. And it was widely criticised by hundreds, if not more, hundreds of academics in the UK. Now clearly any policy based on the findings of that report will be bad policy. Clearly it is a failure of our discipline that such a report could have been published. So how do we move from responses to reports like these to a space where the government actively takes scientific knowledge on board? The debate about critical race theory is unlikely to go away anytime soon. And when it does, there will almost certainly be a new debate. There are many indications that this is a coordinated movement deliberately designed to create political divides. According to an article in The Guardian, The Guardian is a, a national left-wing, left-wing-ish, left-wing UK newspaper, um, so according to an article in The Guardian published in October 2020, until that month, the phrase critical race theory had never once been said in the House of Commons, which is where one branch of our government meets. According to all the official records, the total number of times that the phrase critical race theory had been used in the House of Commons until October 2020 was zero. But somehow, by the end of that month, the government had declared itself unequivocally against this theory that was supposedly being taught in schools throughout the UK. Media Matters for America, a left-leaning non-profit, found that Fox News essentially never mentioned critical race theory before February of 2021. That's what they found when they looked into it. But in the following three and a half months, they mentioned it, Fox News mentioned critical race theory about 1,300 times. So many of us may be pulled into this debate and into the next debate and into the, the next debate after that that's designed to distract us from other conversations about contemporary bias and, and what should be done about it. And of course, join the debate if you wish. And for some of us, it might be an extremely helpful thing to do. Depending on where you are and what you're doing, this could be the best use of your time. But I would ask you to remember a few things. Remember the breadth and the strength of the evidence concerning contemporary bias. Remember how real it is and how invisible it is for so many people in our societies. Remember how far away we are in our governments and our wider populations from an accurate understanding of what bias is or how it works. Remember the many, many important facets of knowledge about contemporary bias, which can, of course, include discussions of critical race theory, but should absolutely not be limited to them. Remember that the final goal is never winning this debate or the next one, but creating a more equal and less prejudiced society. And remember that if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about your answers. So I encourage you, please do put some of your time 
your energy and your brilliance into making sure that you're asking and answering the right questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that useful in some way, and I am opening up the floor for questions, if you have any.